this is. We need you to go over to YouTube. Search Best Song Pop Dance 2020 with Alan Dagel Ibgus Zilu Sion. I love the days with you. You can subscribe to Alan Dagel YouTube channel and follow him for new songs. Go over to A L I N D R A G U on YouTube. Search for his stuff and follow him. And do that. Do it right now. And tell him you heard about it here, Transmania. <laughs> I love that. I'm like, I don't even know what the hell this is. <laughs> I do know what the hell this is. We have got a uh, great guest coming up here in just a few moments. Jerry Hauser is going to be with us. He has got a return visit with us. He's a gentleman who's a quote-unquote gem in more ways than one. He's the dynamic business executive, president of Hattered Diamonds in San Diego. He's going to tell us about the current co coronavirus and how it's affected the diamond business, plus updating us on diamonds, like whether it's true that diamonds are still a girl's best friend. So stay tuned here on our big program. So, Jerry, how are you, sir? Uh, good morning. Fine. How are you? Pretty good, actually. Now, uh, you have had to deal with a heck of a lot with this uh, coronavirus and this lockdown and all these shenanigans. Uh, how has this affected the diamond business? Well, it's like, I think, uh, most other businesses, uh, people are kind of frozen. Uh, I see most of my sales now are for smaller diamonds. Uh, my average carat weight that I was selling before was just a bit over two carats. It's closer to one, one carat to one and a half carat. Uh, major market is uh, engagement rings, uh, wedding bands, and uh, even, even the rings. We have a 30% interest in a custom ring manufacturing company in Los Angeles. And uh, make a long story short, uh, the rings they're making for our clients are basically, you know, they're more in a fifteen hundred to two thousand dollar range, where before it was like twenty five hundred and up. So, and people were buying platinum, are now buying white gold. I mean, it's really, I think, if, I think basically, psychologically, I think we're all in the same boat when it comes to spending money. We have got a great guest with us today. He's a gemologist. He is uh, fantastic. And Jerry Hauser with us today here on our broadcast. So uh, what is your background in the diamond business? Well, I, I grew up all around it. And uh, in fact, I actually grew up around the tra uh, cutting trade. I had family uh, that were diamond cutters. And uh, I went to school for a... Uh, I graduated college with an advertising design and marketing major, and I was doing quite well. <laughs> I did a lot of interesting things, designed that I'm sure your your listeners are familiar with, including uh, designing the logo for Sweet and Sweet and Low, and I can go on and on. But <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> uh, but but I, I, the Japanese people back in the late '60s and early '70s had crazy money. And uh, my my family was selling uh, diamonds. Uh, people would come in from Japan. They go to Forty uh, Seventh Street in Manhattan, and uh, they would buy the diamonds. But then uh, some of the Japanese folks were shopping around Forty Seventh Street, so they sent me out west here, and uh, that's how I got in. And they made me a deal that I couldn't refuse. I was making good money in the in the advertising design business, but. Uh, uh, they bought me a house out here in California, in San Diego, and uh, I put them on a golf course. Uh, San Diego is one of the golf capitals of the U.S., and uh, they never saw the diamonds. They just saw copies of GIA laboratory certificates, the grading reports, and they bought the diamonds. So we were very effective doing that. So that's that's my life story, basically. <laughs> so So... Back up here a second. How how did you end up designing the logo for Sweet and Low? That's a hell of a story. Tell me about oh, that. I, oh, it's <laughs> that, that's a great story. I came out of college uh, in 1960, 
uh, my first job was for a tiny little bit of uh, an agency that uh, got a contract to do all the sugar bags in the world. Okay. How did that happen? Uh, in those days, they only had two printing processes. One was letterpress, which is raised metal, and it, it, it goes, you know, it, it basically prints off that metal. You put the ink on it and so on. And then the other, <clears throat> which was relatively new, was offset printing, which is a thin uh, plate, metal plate, that wraps around the cylinder. Okay. Now, the letterpress would, would put holes in the sugar bag paper because the paper was very thin. And the offset printing would smear, the ink would smear. So somebody in Bergen County, New Jersey, called Bergen Press, uh, developed rubber plate printing. And this little agency that I got my first job in uh, got that contract. So we did all the sugar breaks. And, uh, you know, and then people idea. needed lo logos. I did, I did all, in Texas, I did logo. I did them all over and printed them on the, and they printed it on the sugar bags. So that's what happened. And it's a, it was a great ride. You know, I was just a young kid then. And I did the first lady's rain hat. It was daisies on it, all daisies. <laughs> And it's printed on plastic. So that's well, awesome. Here I am. Yeah, I'm about 24 years old. And what do you know? I'm walking in the rain in Manhattan, and all these ladies are wearing my rain hat that I designed, and they're beautiful. And I wanted to run up and say, "Hey, you're wearing my hat. You know, can I have your phone number?" Ah, <laughs> uh, <never laughs> there you go. Uh, they wanted to that's me with their fantastic. <laughs> that's fantastic. Fantastic. He joins us today here on the Delta talking a little bit about uh, just everything you in history, how it's COVID 19 and uh, everything surrounding that. So, uh, wh what did you major in college? Advertising design and marketing. Wow. So you go from that to being in the diamond business. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, what can I tell you? You know, what do they say? Follow the money. But I, you know, I designed yes. my own website. I, I, I write. I wrote the the website, and I, you know, I do writing and I do some designs for other people. I do a lot of ring designs. Uh, you know, pendants. I can go on and on with stories, but it's just a, it's a great ride. When I tell you this, it's just a great ride. I, you're talking to a man, and your listeners are listening to a man that's lived a phenomenal life, phenomenal. And I, I don't plan on dying. If somebody said that Jerry Hauser died, uh, don't look at my the box in my in the funeral parlor. I won't be in it. It'll be empty. I'll be <laughs> behind my desk. That's fantastic. It'll be empty. I have, I, I have no no reservations. <laughs> Well, I, I, I'll tell you, you've you've accomplished a heck of a lot, and uh, so the diamond and jewelry business um, it has. You mentioned how it's been affected from a financial standpoint. Um, how has it been affected from the standpoint of going out and getting these diamonds and doing all this stuff with this COVID? Well, that's a great question. That is such a good question. Here is. A behind the scenes look to answer this question. Uh, De Beers is an English company. Yes. Uh, they're one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest company in the world. Even possibly even more wealthy and have better cash flow than Apple. Uh, how did that happen? Uh, in 1929 was the crash, right? It was a crash around the world. It was an economic fiasco. And so, uh, when you mine for diamonds, especially in those days, uh, you have to pump out water while you're mining for the diamonds. Diamonds are always found near what's called alluvial deposits, which is water. And so these miners, when the market crashed all over the world, couldn't afford to pay the miners to pump out the water, much less mine the diamonds. So they sold their interest. Either they sold the mine or the marketing interest to the beers. So skipping forward, when the market gets soft and the economy goes down, the beers holds back 
on supplying the diamond rough to the market, you see. So that's one aspect of it. Now you put in, you put that in, uh, in the right perspective now, we have the COVID virus uh, that adds to the problem. You know, people have to be together. Some people wear masks, some don't. Even though the masks are supplied to the miners, uh, this is an, uh, an international, global type crisis. And so uh, there's less supply on the market. Now, what I can tell you is uh, it's very hard to find the very high, very high colors and clarities. And that market has firmed. And a lot of people, which they did in the 70s, uh, when we had a tremendous fear of inflation, people were buying hard assets. It was gold, it was platinum, it was silver, it was junk silver. And when they were finished that accumulation, they dipped their toes into the diamond market, and we had a run on what's called investment diamonds. Now, that market is now firming. In fact, the very best diamond uh, uh, and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the bellwether diamond to follow the market is a one-carat D, D like in David, flawless diamond. And that market just tipped up. And the rest of the market, and the high qualities, are firming. Now, I'm getting more calls now for investment diamonds. Okay, so that, that's pretty much how the uh, COVID, uh, the, the minuses and the pluses of the diamond market right now. Wow. That is uh, that is actually very uh, a, a very interesting deal there. We have got uh, Jerry Hauser with us today. He is a dynamic business executive. He uh, joins us today talking about the diamond business and uh, how it's been affected with COVID-19. So um, I believe you were recommended by Howard Ruff and several other financial gurus. Talk to us a little bit about this. <laughs> Thank you for mentioning that. That's, it was one of the highlights of my life. When people were buying diamonds in the 70s, especially the middle to late 70s, uh, a $12,000 D flawless one carat in 1975 was, was at the New York Diamond Club in New York, which is like saying the cash market is it's the New York Stock Exchange for diamonds which, by the way, I'm a member of, so I'm very familiar with the pricing then. It was, they were running, depending on how well it was cut. Uh, it didn't have any haze, just a beautiful diamond. Uh, it was traveling at about 12,000 a carat, plus or minus 2 or 3%. Uh, in 1979, it was $64,000 four years later. So uh, Howard Ruff... Uh, being a member of the Diamond Club and being able to liquidate, uh, one of his people, Fran Perry, uh, contacted me. And next thing you know, I became a speaker. I was a lecturer. And Howard Ruff was not only uh, promoting gold purchases and other hot assets, he started promoting diamonds. And there's the old saying, you know, uh, an investment is only as good as his liquid. And so I was able to buy and sell diamonds for people. I need to tell everybody that diamonds should be looked at as a, a long-term investment. I don't want to see anybody calling me that's speculating because diamonds could, be, could go up 1% a year when inflation goes up 3%. So uh, I, I just don't uh, – I, I don't want anybody to get hurt. I don't want, I'll sell you a diamond for you at any price, I, the best price I can get, and you can check around. See what a local jeweler or somebody else online – can sell it for, or maybe they'll buy it from you, for, but I doubt it. I, I doubt if they can do a better price than I do. The trick of the game is you buy close to the cash market and you sell close to the cash market. That is the way to buy diamonds for an investment. In fact, any diamond, any diamond. I don't want to sound like I'm making a commercial. I know it's going to sound that way. <laughs> you know, I can't help myself. I'm not going to give the name of the company, my company again, but I'll just let you know is that we are liquidating more diamonds now than we're buying. More people are selling. When you talk about the COVID, yeah. it's, it's not a good thing out there. We have got a uh, great guest with us today. Jerry Hauser joins us here in our broadcast. He is a diamond expert. 
and uh, I always love having Jerry on this program because he uh, he's got all sorts of inside uh, details on all sorts of things. Uh, so so the diamond business uh, with with COVID nineteen and everything, we've kind of been discussing this and batting this around. Um, with with some of these different uh, diamonds and some of these things out there, these precious stones, um, how does your company liquidate some of these? Well, we go to the cash market, which is there's 19 cash. Well, there's more now. They're, they're all over the world. There used to be 19. There's 19 that I go to. Uh, they're in India, uh, Belgium, uh, Israel. Of course, New York, there's one in Los Angeles, there's a small one in Miami. Uh, I wish there was one in Texas, uh, but not yet. Anyway, so, and I go for, you know, some of the other ones in smaller countries, uh, because people in these countries have different markets, like some markets uh, are for smaller diamonds. Like uh, in Singapore, uh, they're giving engagement rings now for about the last, 10 years and mostly small stones so that's a good market for me to go to if there's anybody listening from Singapore they want a diamond they can go directly there to a broker or you can call me obviously but I'm just saying uh, there's specialties there's some prices or some deals only deal in in uh, colored diamonds and they all have to be certified by a credible lab otherwise you're buying a pig in the poke I can say that in Texas, right? A pig in the poke. <laughs> hey, I, 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 I love it. So, uh, so w- what is the difference between uh, a colored diamond and, and some of these others, and, and what, what, what makes one more valuable than the other? What makes more valuable is the rarity. It's the same thing with investment diamonds. You can buy colored diamonds for investment. It's not a quick uh, – it's not as quick – sale. If somebody needs, thinking they may need a million cash, they shouldn't buy colored diamonds, I'm going to wear it. And the diamonds, the color of diamonds are made by, by, by nature. It's how they come out of the mine. There's all kinds of colors, including black and brown diamonds. You know, the trade, uh, we don't call them, we call them brownies and black diamonds. But uh, uh, the trade, you know, the, the retail jewelers call them champagne, chocolate, you know, things that people would can relate to and think it's great. You see, but and now we have certain processes where we can take a real yellow stone. It's not a fancy stone. It's not an exotic yellow color. It's a dull yellow color. And some of them we can do put additional heat and pressure on it. And we have a way of testing it. It could be candidates for what they call high. HBHD, high pressure, high temperature. And what that means is that we can duplicate what nature could do if that diamond rough originally came out of the volcano, which all diamonds come out of the volcano, uh, stayed in there long enough to fully crystallize. So we can fully crystallize the diamond with with additional heat and pressure that nature would have done. Okay? And the same color, they're natural, there's no dyes, there's no radiation, there's no chemicals, there's, there's no fillings, there's nothing. It's just heat and pressure. And if I can't beat anybody in price, I have to finish the sentence. <laughs> I don't want to beat anybody. It's all these riots nowadays. But, but basically, the long and short of it is, is that uh, you can save at least 50, possibly, depending. The, the, the larger the size, the more the discount. So it's between 50 and, and 70, 75% from the same looking diamond that's also natural that stayed in the volcano long enough. We have pink diamonds. We have blue diamonds. We have just, you know, a lot of people call it canary. In the trade, we call it uh, faint, faint pink or faint yellow, uh, vivid color. Uh, you know, it, it has different... Yeah. Training, so we, we can yeah. identify the color rather than say canary. Uh, but again, they have to be certified by a credible laboratory like GIA. Well, uh, well, Jerry, I've got to get to my next guest, but uh, I, I appreciate you being with us. Thanks for being on. Thank you very much. 
And I hope everybody, all your listeners, please stay safe, be well.